The church world have lost a lot of basic family values that were in the church when I grew up. So I don't want to be too nostalgic. And I, you guys know me. i got one foot here and one foot there. I'm in the old school and the new school. I like music on both sides. I like versions of the Bible on both sides. So I'm, 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 I'm a bridge builder. But I tell you, there were some things that were better. And some things are better now. But the one thing that was better then is when you grew up in the church, especially the Pentecostal church, you were expected to have a family altar. It was not a negotiable thing. Your family got in the living room by the couch and prayed or you had an actual altar in your house. How many of you grew up in a church world that expected the family altar to be active in your house? So that's how it was in the world I grew up in, man. We had a family altar. If you don't have a family altar, I wanna ask you a question. Where does your family pray? It doesn't have to be a real altar. It could just be a couch. It could be a, a chair. It could be a, a kitchen table. But I want you to ask yourself that question. Where does my family pray? When does my family pray together? When does that happen? That's a foundation of value in the family. Another thing that we were expected to have is family devotions. And I remember all the devotional books and the family. I hated family devotion, by the way, because we did it at 6 a.m. at my house. But you know what? Even though I hated it, I got up anyway and went to it, and I was full of the word when I got to school. Even though I, you know, I was fully awake and I was full of the word, even though I got up mad every morning because I had to do family devotions at my house. And here my mom and dad pray over me and lay their hands on me. But guess what? I'm a Christian, I'm in ministry, my brother's a Christian, he's in ministry, my sister's a Christian, she's in ministry, my sister's married to a pastor, my, my brother's got a big testimony, man, he joined the gang for a while, but now he is the musician in his, in his little Assembly of God church, and all of us are in the ministry, my two daughters, both married ministers, something kicked in in all those family devotions, whether I was listening or not, the seed got in there. So you have to put the seed in your family, even if they go kicking and screaming, they've got to get the seed in there. How about the, another value was the family table. I, I think it's kind of pathetic that families don't even eat together anymore. I mean, that seems basic. When did your family even get in the room? And have you ever been to a house where everybody eats in a different room? Come on, not on my watch. That shouldn't happen in your house. You have, that time is too valuable. Get them together, even if they're fussing. They need to know who their people are. If they got a bad attitude, so what? Feed them something they love to eat and put a smile on their face. Give them some fried chicken or a cheeseburger, whatever it takes. But get them to the table and get them talking again. The family altar, the family devotions, the family table, family values. And how about family worshiping together? I, I haven't looked in a while, but I, I know there's a scar back here somewhere. Because in my church growing up, I had to sit right in front of my mama. And my mom is this little mean Cherokee woman that, that believed that kids, we didn't know what kids' church was. We didn't, that didn't exist back in the day. We had to sit right in front of our mother, and we had to participate. And if we acted like, I remember one time, I took a chance, because my cousin Mark wanted to play that football game. You know that paper football thing where you flip it? And he had flipped it over on me, and I took a chance, because my, my cousin attended my church, and I went, all right, I'll just flip it back. I flipped it back, and my mom called it the rooster peeping over log. I don't know where she got that from. But she ripped a new one right here, man, in the back of my head. She grabbed that short hair and raised me up off the seat, and I'm going, hallelujah, thank you. I mean, I didn't even know what to say because it hurt so bad, and, and I knew that was going to happen the next time I flipped the football because it was not negotiable. And in the house I grew up in, you couldn't fake being sick to miss church. If you got sick, then you need to go to church because they're going to pray for the sick at our church, and that's what they tell you. Oh, I'm too sick to go to church. Oh, no, if you're sick, you're going to be the first one through the door, and the first one in the altar is what they're going to tell you. See, there was no way getting out of it, man. I, one time I faked the sickness so bad because I wanted to watch Chitty Chitty Bang Bang on the TV. <laughs> All my school friends were talking about it. 
It's like this flying car thing. And I just couldn't imagine going to school without seeing this flying car. And so I faked it and I lied my way through it. And my dad was the pastor and we lived in this little trailer out beside the church. And so my mom left me feverish, of a fake fever, the whole thing. I did the hot rags and the whole bit, man. I was, I was one, my mom, the last word she said when she walked out of here, you better not turn that TV on, boy. And when she called me Timothy Brian Cutshaw, I knew she was upset. She said, Timothy Brian Cutshaw, you better not turn that TV on when I walk out of here. Oh, no, Mom, I'm too sick. I'm too, if you're too sick to go to church, you're too sick. To, you know, that, that whole thing. Well, I watched till I saw the church lights on, and it got dark out there. I flipped on that chitty, chitty, bang, bang, buddy. And I mean, I knew I was probably going to go to hell, but I was going to go happy. Anyway, I'm seeing a flying car right before I die. At least that's, that's what was going through my head. And I kept getting up. I couldn't even enjoy it because I kept waiting on the headlights to come on in the cars. And so I kept saying, I saw a couple of headlights. I flipped that car. I didn't get to see the end of it. I laid down and faked my sickness again. My mom walks in the door. I mean, you know, I'm eight. I hadn't figured this part out. She walked right over to the TV and laid her hand on the TV. And it was hot. They didn't make the kind of TVs back then they make now. It was, it was hot. It had a big tube in it. And I don't even want to tell you the rest of that night, but I've got a story that just won't stop, man. I'm telling you what. <laughs> it went south from there, literally. And, uh, but I got to talk about a flying car the next day, and thank God I lived through it. I barely lived through it, but I did live through it. Family values, church, worship together pray together, have devotion together. Everybody has a Bible and we read it together. That's basic, guys. That's not even hard. That is basic Christian values that we have all but lost in our country, even in the church. Here's the next thing. I really got to hurry. Next thing was speak relationships into existence. God said, let there be light. Notice God never said one time, let there be darkness. No, light dispels the darkness. And here's what I want you to get out of this. You have got to speak light into your house. You cannot just criticize people all the time thinking that it's making them stronger. That's never worked once, by the way. People think it works, but criticizing people all the time makes you, you think that makes you look smart and wise. Uh-uh, you got that all wrong. It makes them resent you, and it doesn't make them strong. You've got to encourage to make people courageous, not discourage. You discourage, you take their courage from them. You encourage, you give courage to them. And so families are stronger because they're stronger together and they encourage one another and someone's always got their back with them. And I don't want to pick on the ladies tonight. This just happens to be a story about a woman in the Bible. And it could just, be, just as easily be the story of a man. So I'll just put that in there. And there's a lot of men guilty of this. But for Proverbs 9 is a story about a woman who builds up this great house with her hands and then tears the whole thing down with her mouth. Think about that. I do all this hard work. I built up this great house with my hands, but then the Bible said she started clamoring, and her clamorous ways destroyed everything she had built up. Her hard work didn't mean nearly as much as she thought it did because she destroyed everything in the house with her mouth. She built it up with her hands and tore it down with her mouth, and the same thing can happen with men as well. We have got to learn how to speak to our family. We've got to bring back words like please and thank you. And you can't, you know, I, I, I'm not picking on anybody, but same is not a real sentence. I just want to say that one time for my generation. If somebody says I love you and you say same, I think they're wanting you to say back I love you too because they need to hear that affirmation sometimes in life. And I know that's what you mean, but sometimes we cannot devalue things that are too important. I miss you. I'm sorry. I love you. All of these things. We must speak life. Here's the next thing. We have got to learn that routines make or break a family. Now that may be, that may just be so simple that it goes right over our head. But have you noticed how God said, God called the daylight and the darkness night and the evening and the morning was the first day. He could have just said it was all one day. No, but he divides it. The Bible says that he walks with Adam in the cool of the day. When does that happen? Two times, morning, night. 
when is the high priest supposed to offer the lamb? In the morning and the evening. So I wanna tell you something. Don't lose sight of your morning routines and your evening routines. Now, you gotta go to school, you gotta go to work, all that in the middle, you're probably not gonna get all that down the way you want it, unless you get to stay home together and you're homeschooling, which praise God for that. If you could see each other all day long, that's great. Most families don't get to do that. So you're, you're in the middle, you don't get that, but guard your morning routine. Guard your evening routine. One of the reasons I'm still in love with this redhead is because every morning of my life, every morning of my life, the first thing she does is wraps her arms around me and gives me a hug. Every morning of my life. We connect every single morning. If I'm gone on a trip, I usually go up and pray every morning. She does her devotions in two different rooms. But if I've gone on a trip, I realize how important it is to reconnect. So on that morning, I'm not putting my, my, you know, anything before the Lord because, you know, I'm in church all the time and I pray a lot. And so, but on those mornings, I sit and have at least one or two cups of coffee with her before I go to pray because that morning routine cannot be neglected. There's morning and evening routines are what is killing families. Now, I grew up in a generation that the families ate breakfast together, lunch at school, and dinner together every night. Anybody remember those days? That you had two meals together every single day. That was conversation. That was interaction because you were together and you were speaking to each other. So the most important routines, if God says, I'll walk with you two times in the day and the rest of the time you got to go to work. He's telling this to Adam and Eve, but in the mornings, I'll meet you there. In the evenings, I'll meet you there. Don't neglect your morning routines and your evening routines because they will mess up your relationships if those routines are not guarded, safeguarded. The rest of the time, you you can't help. You've got to be a part. You've got to do other things. But if, if you have to discipline yourself to get up a little earlier, to just... Do, do something with the kids. You know, my mom and dad are 80 now. And they get up and they play. They like this game called Farkle. And it's this dice game. I don't know if you've ever even heard of it before. But they love it. And every morning when I call them, well, I don't call them every morning. But in the mornings when I call them, I say, hey, guys, who won this morning? Because I can tell you every morning of their life, Dad's going to get up. They're going to go to the table. They're going to have prayer together. They're going to read the Bible. Now they don't like reading the Bible. They like the Bible reading to them. So now it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an app that reads their Bible from the King James Version, no doubt, to them every morning of their life. And then mom's going to make the same breakfast every morning because that's what dad will eat. She can make the same breakfast, and then they're going to sit down and play games for an hour They don't have much to do the rest of the day, but they've got that morning. And you know what they're going to do at night? After dinner, they're going to watch a little show together, and then they're going to go in the living room. We have to do this when we stay with them. This is the routine we get, too. And then then they're going to go in the living room, and they're all going to gather, and they're going to sing a song, or they're going to pray a prayer before everybody goes to bed. The last thing you're going to hear is somebody praying over you every single night. Morning and evening routines. Thank you so much for supporting our ministry. If this has blessed you, please say a prayer for us. And if you would like to give, we have four ways that you can do that. You can give online at briancutshaw.com or if you're a PayPal user, just PayPal us at Church Trainer. Or you can also give through the mail at P.O. Box 267, Georgetown, Tennessee, 37336. Or if you're a Venmo user, you can Venmo us also at Church Trainer. Thank you, and God bless you, and may the Lord multiply your seed. Now back to Hope in the Word. What's the last thing your kids hear? I hope that somebody is praying over them every night, but if not, think about that. When you leave to go on a business trip, what's the last thing your spouse hears? Is it a prayer? Now, my wife is sitting here, so I can't tell you anything that's not true because she's going to vouch for it. But when I go on a business trip, and I think my wife's the least bit nervous about it, you know what happens in our house? She stands by the door. I get out the oil in the kitchen, and I anoint her head and lay my hands on her and pray for her before I go to the airport. And I've done that so many times, neither one of us knows how many times. It happens over and over and over again. you got to pay attention. Some things are important, 
And we cannot let down those values, especially Christian values. I attended a funeral of a minister named Larry Timmerman recently, great man of God. And um, I always loved him, and I went to his funeral, and I was so impressed by something that they said. He, was, he had pancreatic cancer, and he had suffered with it for a while. And um, his family that did most of the talking at the funeral said that every day he would call them and lead the whole family in a prayer. They would have a, a, a not a FaceTime call, but a, a family conference call. And that everybody, the grandkids and everybody, every day for the last couple of years, because he was fighting this battle, he prayed a blessing over them every single day. Now, that's what patriarchs do. How many patriarchs in the Bible do you know that the last thing their family heard was a prayer and a blessing over their life? So I'm going to give you one more thing, and then I'm going to move on to my final point. Um, first of all, love is spelled how? T I. M E. That's how you spell it. I don't know how you will learn to spell it, but that's how you spell love. T I M E. You can't spell it any other way. You can say it a lot of ways, but you can't spell it. You can't show it any other way than an investment of time with the people that you love in your life. You know, we talked about devotions earlier, and to a lot of people, it's like, man, you have no idea what it's like in my house to get the kids full, filled up with a bowl of cereal and out the door for school. You have, I'm making lunch. You have, Dr. B, really? You want to put that on me? Well, let me tell you what Mormon children do. Mormon children go to the uh, Mormon temple every morning at 6 a.m. every morning and study for an hour before they go to school every morning they have to get up and be at the mormon temple or the place where they worship they have to be there at 6 a.m to be taught mormonism before they can even go to school and that happens every day how about jewish children jewish children perry has seen a lot of this as well they can they're required to read the entire torah in hebrew by the age of 12. And you can go to a bar mitzvah and hear these young boys quoting scriptures over and over and over by the age of 12. How about Islamic children? Do you know how many surah, how many, how many scriptures in the Quran that an Islamic child has to be able to quote before they're considered a man or a woman? They're not even considered a man or a woman unless they can quote all these, I think they call them surahs, all these scriptures in the, in the Quran. They're not even considered that. You think, well, you know, that's, that's these cultures. Yes, it's these cultures. And what are we doing in the Christian cultures? At some point in time, we cannot let digital technology raise our children. At some point in time, we have got to let our voice be louder than the coach's voice and the teacher's voice and the principal's voice and the best friend's voice. Our voice needs to be louder than all of those voices in their ears at some point in time. We have five granddaughters. You know, I'm the king of estrogen. All daughters and five granddaughters. No, no boys, man. We just can't have them. i got some couple great sons-in-laws, but that's, we have to marry them because we can't grow them. <laughs> One of our granddaughters just turned seven. She visited last week. Her name is Nora. She visited last week, and her favorite game is Nora wakes up at 5.30, wide open. She does not wake up slow. She comes in the door, out of the door, rubbing her eyes, saying, let's play. And guess what her favorite morning game is? Ask me questions. So I'm going, all right, Nora, how about this? And so she goes to a Christian school. So I said this to her. I said, uh, name me one of the Ten Commandments. She said, well, you want to hear all of them? She's, she just turned seven. She was just barely seven. I said, yeah. She named me all Ten Commandments. No, she's, she's seven. And then I said, well, okay, name me a book of the Bible. Faith was there when this happened. Name me a book of the Bible. Well, well do you want to hear all of them? What? She starts at Genesis and ends up at Revelation. She named every single book of the Bible. She's just seven. I said, okay, I'm going to get you on this one. How about one of the 12 disciples? Well, you want to hear all of them? She names me all 12 disciples. 
I thought, I'm going to get her on this one for sure. Do you know what the 12 tribes of Israel are? You want to hear all of them? Names me all of the 12 tribes. This just happened last week. Names me all the 12 tribes of Israel. And then she said, Papa, while we're on a roll, you want me to tell you every continent and every ocean? Why not, Nora? She named every continent. She named every ocean. And then at 545, she named every president from George Washington. And her last word was Biden. <laughs> that's, a, that's how she ends it. So anyway, but she, she named every single president from George Washington and named me every capital of every state in the United States all before 6 a.m. And she's not Mormon. She is a Christian. And she is, we have got to understand that God has given us a family for a reason, but we have got to bring family value. Don't devalue the purpose and the influence of the family in the world. It's great families that build great nations, and we need great families, strong families in the body of Christ again. We need, I love the prayer that Gio prayed earlier for strong mamas and strong daddies. We need that prayer. We need more of that. So I'm going to end with this one. Speak blessings. Genesis 2 and 3. Then God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it because in it he rested from all of his work that God had created and made. He spoke a blessing over it. John Kilpatrick was standing right here where I'm standing and told this story. Some of you heard it. He said that when he built the Brownsville Church, that he built this huge orchestra pit and that he just knew by the time the church would get built that somebody would come and that, that would have an orchestra because he knew he had musicians in the church. And he said on the dedication day, he was so disappointed, so disappointed that he didn't even want to go because the whole church was full, but there was no person in that orchestra pit. And he had rearranged the, the, the architectural work. And he said, I had this big hole behind me and it embarrassed him. To the point that he said, I, I didn't even want to go in the church anymore. I was, all I could see is that hole in the middle of the stage. And, and, he's, and he said, uh, the Lord, he, he went to the Lord because three or four months, he was starting to get depressed over it. And he went to the Lord and he said, Lord, uh, what's wrong? I really feel like you want me to do that. And then the Lord said, well, I said, I can't bless it because you keep cursing it. He said, if you would stop cursing it and start blessing it, I could bless that hole in the middle of your stage. But I can't bless it when everything you say about it is cursing it. And the Lord got to him and he went, started going on Saturday night. Wearing his jogging pants late at night on Saturday night. He'd go in there and he'd say, Orchestra pit, one of these days you're going to play music before the Lord. I bless you in Jesus' name. And he started speaking life into a hole in the middle of the floor. Orchestra pit, one of these days the world is going to hear your music around the world. He'd speak life. Two months went by, nothing happened. He's still speaking life. Orchestra pit, in the name of Jesus, you're going to live. You're going to have music around the world. I think this went on for six months, and he still has no musician in the orchestra pit. He's blessing it now, not cursing it. He gets a call from a guy in the military that says, Pastor John, he said, I'm retiring from the military, and you were my favorite pastor. I just decided to move to Pensacola and live, let you be my pastor again. He said, by the way, since I've been in the military, I started playing the trumpet. Do you guys have an orchestra? He said, oh, man, we got the greatest orchestra pit you've ever seen. He said, I don't care if you forget your suitcase. Don't you forget that trumpet. When you walk in this building, you better have that trumpet on you. And that guy walked in there by himself, that military, retired military guy, climbed in that hole in the floor by himself and began to play the trumpet. And that's how it began. Revival broke out. And before it was over, it was absolutely filled from one side to another. And guess what? Just like God promised, the whole world heard the sound from that orchestra pit because God said, as long as you curse it, I can't bless it. But if you'll start blessing it, then I will also bless it. Here's what I want to say to you in closing. You need to bless your kitchen. 
Walk in your kitchen. Say it's blessed. If he can bless a hole in the stage, you can bless your kitchen. You can bless your living room. You can bless your bedroom. You can bless your children's room. You can stuff a prayer cloth under the mattress and dare the devil to come near your child. You have that right in Jesus' name. You can stand up. You can, you can take a stand against the enemy and declare that this is a holy place and you're not allowed on it. We're drawing a blood line around it and you cannot live here you cannot operate here you cannot invade our sleep you cannot open portals that invade my children's mind because by the authority of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth I stand up against you I am a blood-bought child of God an heir and anoint and a joint heir with Jesus Christ you're not just messing with anybody you're messing with somebody with authority that the Lord has given authority and in the name of Jesus I declare that this house is blessed in the name of Jesus. I declare that God is going to do a great thing in this house in the name of Jesus. Yeah, I want to tell you, you don't need to just live in a house. You need to live in a holy house. You need to live in a sanctified house. You need to live in a blessed house. So this is what the Lord said to Aaron. He said, this is how I want you to bless the people. And if you say this over them, you're going to put my, I'm going to ask the musicians to come. You're going to put my name on them. Get this. The Lord bless you and keep you. If you go to global prayer, I end this way every time. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And listen to this next verse. He said, if you say that to them, look at verse 27. So they shall put my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. All you need to do is sign God's name to your property. All you need to do is put God's name back on the title. Put God's name back in your family. That's all you have to do, and he can turn things around. He can take what the devil's trying to steal from you right now. I know the devil hates family. The devil hates marriage. The devil hates life. He hates purity, and he's trying to take everything he can take, but in the name of Jesus, I declare that if whatever God has put together, let no man and no demon put asunder. If God God has put it together, then God can bless it and keep it and keep it safe. This program is brought to you by the partners of Brian Cutshaw and Church Trainer Ministries. Please help us pray that the Lord will continue to send us more partners so we can expand his kingdom around the world.